Thank you, Peter. Thank you, Janet. It was such an honor to hear both from both of you about FDA perspectives regarding some of the most important issues and opportunities uh, in pediatric drug development. Uh, now, I also wanted to take the opportunity to discuss these same issues with uh, some of our global regulatory colleagues and uh, also to understand a little bit about industry perspectives about these issues as well, uh, specifically understanding how our global uh, regulatory colleagues approach, uh, you know, how is their approach to pediatric drug development? understanding their perspectives on cell and gene therapy techniques and technologies, where is the field in some of the other countries like Japan, and understanding their thought process about utility of real-world data, real-world evidence in pediatric drug development. Um, in that, I'm actually honored to welcome uh, a couple of my colleagues uh, uh, and partners from uh, EMA, uh, so Dr. Ralph Bax, who is the head of pediatric medicines at EMA, and uh, Kristin. Uh, Van Gogh, who is from, uh, I'm having a little bit of a meeting here in Minsk, uh, who is the executive director and uh, global regulatory innovation at Cicada. And uh, also uh, Dr. Junko Sato, who is the office director of, of, of uh, international programs uh, at PMDA Japan, and Dr. Agnes Klein from Health Canada, who is the senior medical advisor in pediatric drug development there. I specifically wanted to thank Dr. Junko Sato, who is joining us from Japan, where it is, I think, 10 p.m. Uh, in her time. So uh, again, thank you so very much for, for being here and uh, providing us with your perspectives. First of all, I'm going to ask uh, Dr. Sato, who is online, and uh, ask her to provide their, her perspectives. And then subsequently, I'll invite Dr. Agnes Klein as well. Yes. So thank you for the giving this opportunity. So I'm Junko Sato. Uh, associate chief ex uh, associate executive in PMDA. So, I'd like to talk about the pediatric global pers uh, perspective and importance. So, this slide shows the current circumstance in pediatric drugs in each country. Unmet medical needs is so high on pediatric drug area, especially in neonates. So, in each country, so. Yes, I think. However, the population no could you back to please? So however, the population is getting small, especially in developed countries. On the other hand, developing cost is increasing year by year. To resolve this issue, utilization of new tools such as real world data, decentralized clinical trial are expected. Next, please. Yes, as you know, Japan is an Asian country. We always consider collaboration with other Asian countries to resolve unmet medical needs issues. This slide shows us number of clinical trials in the world. The origin is clinicaltrial.gov. So I show red circle. Red circle is a uh, Asia uh, Oceanian area. The total number of clinical trials in Asia and Oceania is around 30,000. It is less than a country, United States. It means Asia has a hidden capability in clinical trial. Of course, it is not easy to utilize such hidden uh, uh, capability. I would like to share our challenge for it. Next, please. So as you may know, EMA, FDA, Health Canada, Australian TGA, and PMD has a pediatric cluster to discuss the latest general issue, development of individual product, etc. Also, these are so active member of ICH, it is develop the, the group develop harmonized guidelines. Such a discussion is very important to develop harmonized guidelines and also progress regulatory sciences. However, in this country, the number of newborn is in decreasing. It means the enrollment of clinical trial in pediatric population is getting difficult comparing with decades ago. On the other hand, imagine area, for example, Asian country, ASEAN country, the population is still increasing. Many babies are born every year. But usually, emerging countries do not have so much experience 
to conduct a clinical trial. But as, uh, as regulators, we would like to share our experience to accelerate clinical trial in such countries. Next, please. It is the Asian Training Center for Pharmaceutical and Medical Devices Regulatory Affairs. It was established in 2016 within PMDA. As described in the name, primary target is Asian regulator, but we also allow outside of Asian regulator to join it. PMDA invites participants and pay their travel cost, hotel accommodation, and provide a seminar to the participant. Next, please. So PMD provides around 10 seminars every year. One of them is a pediatric review seminar. It is co-organized by USFDA and PMDA. EMA is also joined as a lecturer. Through the seminar, PMD expect participating regulatory authority acquire the same skill as PMDA as soon as possible. Of course, Improving the skill of regulatory authority will not revitalize the pediatric drug development. However, in some country, regulatory authority is a late limiting factor to start clinical trial, making it impossible to participate in global clinical trial. We hope it will be a useful tool to resolve this problem. Next, please. So I'd like to touch uh, our challenge to utilize real-world data because real-world data can be used to develop drugs for small populations, such as children, including uh, neonates. To accelerate the utilization, Japanese regulator released these document. Next, please. We also uh, prepared special scientific advices for utilization of registry data. Next, please. So this is the details of scientific advice for registration data. So registration, uh, registry holder can request advice to PMDA before development of registry. Next, please. So I would like to touch uh, quite a new project. We just started a new project described here. It is a real world data utilization promotion project. Sorry, the name is a little bit long. In order to promote the use of real world data more than ever before, it is important for developers such as registry, registry folder to understand the connect to understand the concept of quality control and quality assurance required in new drug application and or uh, marketing authorization application. Also, regulators should understand the current status of data quality control, reliability assurance, management system, etc., as a registry holder. And based on the experience and knowledge, regulators should provide guidance and scientific advice to applicant. The personal exchange and opinion exchange between a selected registry, uh, registry holder and the PMDA will be planned in this project. It is a two years project. The purpose is to deepen mutual understanding to disseminate knowledge regarding a major to ensure the reliability of NDA level data. Category B and C are for premature institutes. Basically support are provided by PMDA. Applications for this project just closed. So currently we are selecting uh, registry, registry holder. Next, please. To provide necessary medical product to patient, uh, various major is planned. I will show uh, examples. 
First one is a collaboration among industry, academia, healthcare professionals. If industry applies a project, Japan Pediatric Society kindly supports the clinical trial. Dr. Hide Nakamura, I guess he is in the venue. So he is a key person of this project. Second one needs just plan, not yet started. Drug laws are getting big problem in Japan, especially orphan drug and also pediatric drugs. To combat the issues, MHLW, Ministry of Health, Labor and Welfare requested the budget to establish new center within PMDA. It is a scientific advice center for pediatrics and orphan drugs to promote development of drugs for children and rare disease patients. This is still the budget request stage. If we can secure the budget, we will be able to start this project. Next one, please. So this is the last slide. Today, I shared uh, our challenge in my talk. Global collaboration is more important day, day by day. It is necessary efficient development and data collection through product life cycle. To deepen understanding and collaboration, I wanted to go uh, to go to the venue and discuss with you directly. Unfortunately, I can't join a uh, conference in person at this time. I hope I can talk a lot with you next time. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Sato. Um, good to have you here, even if it is virtual. Uh, next, I'd like to invite Dr. Agnes Klein from Health Canada, who is a senior medical advisor uh, uh, within the Office of Director uh, General at, at Health Canada, and provide her uh, perspectives from uh, Health Canada side as well. Thank you. Uh, good morning, everybody. I am really pleased to be here and just address a couple of points, I think. Uh, the general tendency internationally, of course, is to try and achieve harmonization. One of the one of the issues that we have grappled with is that our regulations were, uh, and we're still in the process of working on that, is that our regulations were outdated. Uh, the 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 issue is that there are there is a cascading set of of legislation one of them being a uh, Food and Drugs Act and regulations, which actually provides the regulator with the authorities to do certain things on demand and, and enforce others. And we had a number of gaps. The first gap that was filled in was the, um, the authority to um, compel industry to do studies when there was a safety issue and the drug was also necessary. And there are various ways to do that, but it's simply we needed the authority so that we could demand public uh, the post-market uh, um, follow-up of the drugs and so on. One of the things that was lacking and there was a gap is the authority to actually require and request pediatric uh, pediatric studies in particular. One of the impediments was that there was an old, the, the ethics establishment was in the, it, in the hands of the Medical Research Council. And at the time that the first set of, of ethics was developed, there was a problem with, with prohibiting the study of the studies of, of clinical trials in pediatrics. Um, that was the first thing that we had to really address and change. Um, at the moment, they are they we are the, uh, grappling with a number of issues. One of them being modernizing the entire regulations, because what came in light during COVID is that there are a lot of uh, agilities and collaborations internationally that Canada has been involved in where we need the authority to do so within the regulations. So we call that sort of, you know, dubbed the, the, the misnomer or, or, or the, the name of it is we call them as agile licensing of drugs and devices as a, as a title to review the entire regulatory framework 
and much of what has been said by my colleagues in from the FDA is going to go in those kinds of regulations. Um, we're working on an ATP framework. We're working on a pediatric framework and an action plan. And we are going to be uh, ensuring that really the regulations and all the processes in, uh, um, attendant to it are actually harmonized. Uh, one of the things that I want to bring to the attention too, that despite those impediments, we really had a guidance for inclusion of, PDF, of children in clinical trials before even um, ICH had even started drafting theirs. And it was concurrent to the first um, attempt by the FDA or the first um, endeavor by the FDA to bring children into clinical trials. Somehow it was never officially, uh, for a number of reasons, it was not officially endorsed, but we use it as a guidance when we provide a guide to industry. At the moment, we are actively involved in relooking at all our submissions where uh, pediatric community has indicated that they have a gap in indications and in dosage forms. And for the most part, I think we don't have a much work to do in that area, but we have looked at it and a pilot phase will be announced sometime before the end of this year. So that's generally the the where we stand. Um, we still have some work to do in the area of of grappling, particularly in um in our healthcare system because of our healthcare system in the areas of rare diseases, which has not does not uh, would not have to be an impediment, nevertheless to industry filing for submissions if they have a drug that is uh, if, would be useful to file. And we've used every single method that we can have at our disposal uh, to be able to uh, allow some of these, all of these drugs on the market. So one of the big impediments, of course, is that Canada has a small drug market and financially it is not very lucrative as a result. And finally, the issue is that that um, one of the the one of the problems is that every province will decide what is going to be reimbursed and what is not going to be reimbursed. So work is going on at the federal level to figure out what authorities and what incentives can be provided to industry and everybody to um, develop and think about and develop drugs for rare diseases. We also have some some nuclei within the country of founder populations that have some very unique rare diseases um, proper to Canada as well. So that's generally the perspective. I think you know there is a we we have a we have a guidance now in place for diversity inclusion, which is harmonized with what is happening in other jurisdictions. So there should be no impediment to filing for instance, drug submissions in a very broad manner. And I think, you know, the general approach to pediatrics has been the similar one that, that has been described for gene therapies and genetic manipulations for uh, by, by uh, Dr. Marx. So I think, you know, there is, we are on, on the same page and our collaboration in the class diverse clusters has um, allowed us to appreciate where we have the gap better, where we have the gaps, and where we need to do a little bit more work. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Klein, for your remarks and providing Health Canada perspective as well. Uh, now I'd like to invite on the stage uh, Dr. Ralph Bax, uh, who is the Director of Pediatric Medicines at EMA, and uh, Dr. Kristin Van Goor, who is the Executive Director of Regulatory Policy at Takeda, uh, to provide their remarks as well. So you may want to say it or whichever it is. Thank you. 
I think mine is on. Yeah. So, Kristen, if you want to go first. Perfect. Yes. So, uh, Kristen, please go ahead and uh, share your perspective from industry regarding this entire conversation. Sure, will do. I feel like we're maybe trying to pull off between two ferns up here. It won't be that funny, I promise. <laughs> um, it's okay. So I, I, I will take a step back from an industry perspective. When we look at, when we look at public-private partnerships, when we look at CPAP collaborations, I've seen a lot of these over the years in drug development and it was said earlier today, but the number one thing that we look at from an industry perspective is regulator engagement. Who's coming to the table and are they showing up in a meaningful way? Are they sharing insights that we're not getting from other places? And um, and so that's, you know, it's great to see everyone here today. It really gets these collaborations off to a very strong start. Um, it builds confidence in where the initiative could go and hopefully decreases regulatory uncertainty regarding the outcomes for the work. So, so that's really one of the most important things that we look at from an industry perspective. And to the point about regulatory uncertainty, I think we had some very good conversations yesterday. And, you know, one, I think there's a lot of power, magic, whatever it might be, and getting people together in person. And after months of meeting over Zoom, over the phone, over email, we finally surfaced some of the concerns, some of the questions that were on all of our minds. And I think that's a really important step in forming these collaborations. And with that is transparency from all parties regarding what they hope to achieve in the collaboration, what is valuable to them, um, and really articulating that, that clearly. I think we saw this years ago in the biomarker qualification space where we were talking past each other on context of use. Um, and, and I think, I, you know, looking back, I think that was really the core barrier is we were not articulating context of use. We were not being clear about what our intent in undergoing this develop, these development efforts was. And then at the end of the day, we'd compare notes and be like, well, I thought you were doing this. And then the regulator would say, well, I thought you were doing this and the evidence doesn't match. So the earlier we can have those really crystal clear conversations. I want to use this biomarker for an efficacy endpoint. That is a very specific evidentiary bar. And once you start that conversation, then you can dig into the knowledge gaps. Then you can dig into the evidence generation plan. And then everyone is on the same page in articulating where the uncertainty lies and, and more importantly, how much uncertainty is appropriate in the given context. And this is where I think having the patient organizations, not just at the table, but really engaged in a meaningful way in sharing their perspective. And, you know, in some ways, I think perspective has become a little bit of a weak word. Um, if you think about understanding someone's perspective, it means that you could say, summarize where they're coming from, what their motivations are, why they're doing the things they're doing. And they'll say, that's right. You got it. You understood me. So that's where we need to get um, with the patient perspective. And that's everything. That's not just patient reported outcome development. That's clinical trial duration. That's perspectives on placebo. That's tolerance for uncertainty at the time of approval. It's the whole, it's all the dimensions that feed into the efficiency and the effectiveness of drug development. So so those are some of my thoughts. I don't know if that's where you thought it was going, Klaus. But. No, that, this is this is fantastic because it's all about under. So, and and we, this is this is so critical to make sure that we align everyone's perspective that in and understand what that actually means. Your your points are very valid because you really need to understand how the world looks like from 
a vantage point that you're looking the world at mm -hmm. because it's, you know, the, the elephant in the dark room kind of, kind of problem. And, uh, the, the, it's really critical to be able to put yourself in the shoes of the people that are having the different other perspectives and make sure that you're aligning from the very beginning as to what the expectations are mm -hmm. and the definition of the term. So that, that's, that's fantastic. And that's certainly what the, what the concept of the public private partnerships are supposed to bring to the table. Can we uh, yes, agreed. Um, right. Uh, thank you so much, Kristen. Really good to have you here. And uh, uh, it was interesting to learn about industry perspectives, what specifically what industry members look at when deciding to participate in these public-private partnerships and what we can do better to actually meet meet the goals mm -hmm. and uh, you know their expectations in terms of making drug development in some of these vulnerable areas easier and faster uh, thank you appreciate it and now i'm actually honored to have uh, 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 dr ralph bax who is the director of pediatric medicines at european medicines agency mm -hmm. and uh, i would like to give the floor to him and provide uh, ema perspectives about some of the things that our fda colleagues already discussed uh, harmonizing global regulatory approaches, uh, EMA perspective on cell and gene therapies, uh, EMA perspective on real world evidence, real world data, and anything and everything else that you might want to talk about. Thank you. Okay, now no, it should work. Uh, yes, uh, it, it's really a privilege to be here um, and, and, and also to see you in person, actually. Uh, how much time do I have? I mean, you have given me so many topics. I think we we would need to discuss at least a week. That's why I said anything you want to talk about. It uh, okay, have to be okay. Uh, okay. If we start perhaps with harmonizing approaches, um, yes, actually, my first request was to to understand and harmonize the understanding of what is a fireside chat. Um, <laughs> We don't have a fire here, but it's close enough. You know, you know, with our, with our. I mean, it, it, it's really amazing nowadays uh, having Junko and and Agnes also on the line. And um, in, indeed, it, it it is really about trust and commitment, as you as you have as you have mentioned. Um, and and that um, we had an example. And sorry if I refer often to pediatric oncology because. This is an area where, uh, in our space, we we started uh, we started these journeys, and and potentially compared to neonatology, for example, they were always just a little bit ahead of us. Um, so, for transparency, we're just having at EMA actually um, a pediatric strategy forum um, in this space, and and they work in a way that this is a partnership and initiative actually supported by patient organizations and and where on a regular basis um, all come and meet and discuss a condition and industry is invited to, to share what they have um, at in, in their development space. So what molecules they might have. And, and this is what I also mean by, by trust. And it, 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 in this case, it took many years. So we have advanced a lot. Uh, uh, recently, we had a C4C, a perinatal asphyxia, a multi-stakeholder meeting. And, and nowadays, you know, we are so advanced. We firstly decide we we to do it. Secondly, there are partners who actually know how to do it. I mean, I'm not, EMA doesn't, I mean, I'm not saying EMA knows how to do it. We, we need the experts. We need the experts from all fields um, and, and also organizational wise. So, uh, so if I refer again to C4C, for example, yeah, they have built up successfully a huge infrastructure where, you know, we can not only clack, uh, 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 get get clinical expertise, but also specific patient expertise. And I must admit, I mean, from a regulatory perspective, it has been also a journey, including patients. Yes, taking into account patient perspective, what does that actually mean? I mean, we are now at a stage that they are sitting at early discussions at the table. They are, you know, helping to design a clinical study. They tell us what what a clinical relevant endpoint it is. So it's not about just reducing the amount of seizures to fifty percent. No, it's 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 really uh, sp being more specific. What is useful for a school child, for example, 
Yes, um, in the regulatory space, obviously, we also have to have multi-stakeholder meetings, even if they are only perhaps between regulators, to exchange, to understand each other. Uh, uh, our pediatric cluster has been mentioned. I just wanted to make a point that we are using a lot of word global, um, but what is really global? So, um, so firstly, the pediatric cluster could for sure be uh, broadened to to include more regulatory colleagues, and 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 then perhaps we should also consider a little bit more low and middle income countries. So here, uh, as also as a regulatory colleague from FDA, um, and and Health Canada and all those present, obviously um, support WHO activities for the pediatric regulatory network, and as has also been managed, uh, mentioned, this is this took off. I mean, pediatric development really took off with having a backbone of legislation behind it. Um, and, and here we are gaining experience. So EMA is gaining experience also a lot from FDA colleagues. So FDA, for example, has been pushing, pushing against, again, in oncology for target approaches. Uh, we are now discussing, so we have been involved, we, we, we are using similar approaches, but it's not yet supported by legislation. Um, so we are moving in the future towards a more patient-led and, and pediatric-led development. As you know, up to now, a lot is defined by adult development because uh, yeah it, 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 medicine is developed in adults and then you know yes actually we are now obliged also to uh, develop for children which has the paradigm has changed immensely um uh, during the last decade but now we need to we need to move forward there are still gaps there are still molecules to be developed potentially specifically for children and here for example the future legislation proposal foresees a mode of action approach so the regulator can ask a developer you know this target might be useful in a completely different um, um condition or indication in children please do have a look at it and please uh, develop here if certain criteria are fulfilled. So my call is a little bit to to broaden, um, to make sustainable all these initiatives. Um, if I hear that, I have to manage expectations. Uh, what my colleague just said from FDA about about um, we should now work very fast and simultaneously and day and night also the same as we did uh, in the COVID um, uh, space. Uh, and, and here also regulators obviously need to make sure they remain sustainable um, because otherwise, and, 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 and that resource-wise also would have to be supported, but obviously uh, principally also fully supported um, from our side. Um, just one perhaps further um, First, uh, a remark on 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 advanced medicinal uh, med um, ATMP, so uh, gene and cells um, based uh, medicines. Here, it's really an exciting field, but we we need specific expertise. We need communication, as has been mentioned. So also um, our agency offers to non for profit and academic. Um, developers to interact uh, on a regular basis. And this is also a so in a sort of pilot, um, a very similar to what um, FDA um, has just mentioned. Uh, I will not go now in all the, the, the um, ethical regulatory challenges and also obviously scientific and technical challenges where we all have to learn. So to get this regulatory certainty is not just, you know, now the regulatory deci regulator decides it's fine. We need to communicate. We need to exchange and then develop the way forward and, and, and so to say then together also develop this certainty. Um, and, and and finally, regulatory um, um, real world evidence and data. I like the sentence. We will have to get used to it. Um, 
uh, it, I mean, on the other hand, I, I just wanted to read out to you a strategy statement. So by 2025, the use of real world evidence will have been enabled and the value will have been established across the spectrum of regulatory use cases. So that is quite ambitious, uh, considering its end of uh, 2023. Um, we looked at data in how far real world um, data have been included in, um, and this has been published, in initial marketing authorizations. So here it's about 40%, and in extension of indications, it's 18%. And uh, what are we doing in pediatrics? So we have opportunities also internally to address questions, for example, about clinical context, um, about epidemiological data. Um, here we, we, we see a challenge in the databases we have had access to. So uh, often we have to realize in, in Europe, that all these databases actually hardly include pediatric data, or if so, at a very high level, or if so, exactly not in that age range we are looking for. So if we go to uh, the youngest patients, we are putting and setting all our hope on the um, activity of INC. Um, and uh, so, so that is being um, being increasingly used also from actively from our side to support our regulatory decision making at an early on uh, point of time, um, which the PIP pediatric investigation plan offers as an opportunity. And in the in the future, this PIP will also be able, so we're just doing a pilot and harmonizing uh, potentially here uh, more with the FDA approach, because at the moment, developers are expected to, you know, in one go, the initial PIP to tell us and provide us a plan with what they are planning to do for all age groups uh, right from the beginning. And in the future, we are now, we are now testing a stepwise approach where this plan can also be developed across the life cycle. So with more evidence becoming available, we then define together with the applicant next steps. And, and, and this enables us for sure also, if applicants come early, to discuss new approaches like integration of uh, real world data and evidence, how to do, uh, how to use extrapolation um, and and it's a journey. I mean, we are we are traveling together on. And with this, I wanted to stop for the moment. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ralph. Uh, great to hear from you. It was it was interesting to hear you talk about INC's real world data activities, and that's actually going to. I'm going to make the transition to our next uh, topic of uh, the day for this uh, plenary meeting, which is. Focusing a little bit more uh, on on uh, real world data, real world evidence, and its utility, uh, challenges, opportunities that real world evidence might provide uh, in uh, in advancing drug development efforts for some of these vulnerable populations that are being discussed uh, in this meeting today. Um, and uh, firstly, I just wanted to thank you for your time and for being here. Yes, really good to meet you. Thank 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 you.